Oh, Lord Buddha, keep my mind sharp and my memory clear as I recount this tale. I tell of warriors and weapons, faith and fury, and a man whose like we shall not see again. Devapala, son of Dharmapala, the greatest ruler of the Pala dynasty. From his ancestors he inherited the fertile earth and thick jungles of Bengal, a realm where tigers prowl, reptiles swim, and the sacred waters of the Ganges empty into the sea. This is the land of the Mahayana, the great vehicle of Buddhist teachings a creed that guides us towards nirvana, an enlightened escape from the endless cycle of birth and rebirth. Some call the life of a monk difficult, but they know nothing of that of an emperor. We monks must only care for the spiritual welfare of our people. An emperor, however, taints himself daily with their material concerns, miring himself in dissatisfaction. Dissatisfaction is an inherent aspect of our material existence. That is the first noble truth. Devapala's aspiration in life was selfless. To become a bodhisattva, an enlightened being who forestalls nirvana in order to hold the door open for others rather than locking it behind him. To do this, he sought to build an empire and rule benevolently, improving the lot of his subjects. A noble aim, but one not easily accomplished in such violent times. Devapala knew that he needed to secure Bengal's borders before he could rebuild its interior. Summoning his armies, he sent his cousin and commander Jayapala to demand the submission of the neighboring realms of Kamarupa and Utkala. While Kamarupa submitted almost instantly, Utkala fought hard. As the bodies of the slain piled up, Devapala began for a moment to doubt the virtue of his cause. Yet as the months passed and the wounds of the realm healed, these doubts slowly vanished. His heart bloomed as he observed the prosperity of his land and the contentment of his people. We are what we think, and what we think we become. Our thoughts shape the world, said the Buddha. Devapala's shaping of the world had only just begun. An idea developed and acted on is better than an idea that merely exists as an idea, said the Buddha. Devapala's successes in Kamarupa and Utkala filled him with increasingly ambitious ideas. The first he acted on was his desire to control the sacred city of Kanoj, a place that rulers and empires had coveted for centuries. To hold its central temple would be the ultimate stamp of legitimacy. Desire is the source of dissatisfaction and is inextricable from it. That is the second noble truth. Devapala was not alone in his ambition, however. Two other great powers, the Pratiharas of the West and the Rashtrakutas of the South, rivals of the palace for generations, also lay claim to the glorious city. Formidable figures led the enemy armies. The young Pratihara king Mihira Borja had just subdued his neighbors and bolstered his cavalry with a new breed of horses, the swiftest to be found in all of India. Amukvasha, pride of the Rashtrakutas, oozed confidence after crushing a series of rebellions with a deadly force of infantry and elephants. Old family friends indeed as Utkala had so eloquently put it. Endurance is among the most arduous disciplines, but the final victory makes its way to the one who endures the most, said the Buddha. So it was with the Palas, who often won battles not with tactics, 
but with an uncanny ability to outlast their rivals. Devapala's orders were clear. Kanoj was not to be damaged. The man who would be a bodhisattva would not see this holy site defiled by the evils of war. Battles raged outside of the city for days, until the Pratihara and Rashtrakuta armies finally sounded the signal to retreat. Following his victory, Devapala invited into his entourage Brahman, the priest who had first welcomed him into Kanoj. That man was I, humble Viradeva, who would soon grow closer to the emperor than anyone. To destroy what is around us is to destroy ourselves. To cheat another is to cheat ourselves, said the Buddha. The Honas, predatory horse lords of the northern plains, were a living mockery of these words. Long had they lain dormant, drunk on wealth and decadence, but the chilling memories of their wretched work of village cities and plundered crops, of burnt monasteries and butchered monks, were as vivid in our minds as the sheen of the morning sun on the snowy clouds of distant mountains. Equally dreadful were the rumors that these Hunnas, who watched with glee as their neighbors whittled each other down, had begun to stir once more. The Pratiharas and Rashtrakutas may have been long-time enemies of Devapala's family, but unchecked, the Hunas posed an even greater threat. Renunciation of desire will bring an end to one's dissatisfaction. That is the third noble truth. So Devapala renounced his struggle with his forefathers' rivals and marched his forces north into the demon's lair to crush the foul Hunas forever. Evil must exist so that good can prove its purity, said the Buddha. The Pala army shone like the brightest of lights as it plunged into lands darkened by the Hunas' corrupt and wicked ways. No obstacle was too great for it, no foe too fierce. Some Hunas saw the error of their ways and pledged themselves to our monks' teachings. Those who did not were struck down or vanished into the shadows. As Devapala strolled through the ranks of his cheering warriors, I was elated by our victory. Yet something in the Emperor's gaze stirred a feeling of dread within me. The would-be Bodhisattva was now being hailed as a great conqueror above all and I feared that this change had taken root even in the Emperor's mind. It is in one's own mind, not their enemy or foe, that lures them to evil ways, said the Buddha. As I feared, our Emperor had indeed changed. The seed of self-righteousness planted long ago and nurtured by uninterrupted success, had begun to bear fruit. In Devapala's mind, the ends now justified the means, no matter how terrible or costly. And so he ordered a campaign to the south to subjugate the Pandyas, a proud people who were former allies and trading partners of his, and bring them the teachings of the Buddha. When word of this reached me, I burst into my emperor's chambers, begging him to reconsider. Needless aggression is not the mark of a virtuous ruler, I said, and forced conversion only thickens the resolve of a people against the creed. I told him that this war would cost thousands of lives and bring suffering to countless more. But the words that once guided him toward the path of light now fell on deaf ears. It is as one near the summit of the mountain that the footing becomes most treacherous. 
Now all I could do was helplessly watch as the armies of a tyrant descended upon a new victim. You only lose what you cling to, said the Buddha. Devapala found that to be all too true. The more he tightened his grip on the self, the more it, or perhaps more accurately its ashes, slipped through his fingers. My emperor and his bellicose cousin had created a nightmare. There was no cheer or pride to be felt. As the Pala army struck its tents and began the long march back home, the stench of death and smoke choked the air, punctuated by the haunting wails of the broken people that my emperor and his forces left behind. Tormented by the recognition of his arrogance and its price, Devapala breathed not a single word during the entire week-long journey home. Just as a snake sheds its skin, we must shed our past time and time again, said the Buddha. Devapala sat meditating in silence for days in the great temple, refusing to eat and only occasionally sipping the water beside him. Finally, he turned to me, took my hands in his, stared into my eyes in regret, and pledged to make amends. Dwell not on the past, nor dream of the future. Focus your mind fully on the present moment, I told him, repeating the words of the Buddha. The Noble Eightfold Path is the way by which one can renounce desire, end dissatisfaction, and attain enlightenment. That is the fourth noble truth. I told Devapala that he still had a realm to rule, people to care for, and borders to protect. That the fate of an entire empire rested on his weary, half-starved shoulders. As I stared into my emperor's sunken eyes, I saw a glimmer of hope ignite into fiery resolve. Another worldly energy possessed him, emanating from every aspect of his being, and right then I knew that the old Devapala had returned for good. He would need that unfaltering resolve in the coming months. Infuriated by his foray south, and emboldened by his failure to hold on to his new possessions, the Pratiharas and the Rashtrakutas leapt at their weakened prey. Devapala still had one last war to fight. It is better to travel well than to arrive, said the Buddha. My emperor and I pondered these words as we gazed across the city from the palace tower. It was curiously soothing to observe from above, as the monks returned to their temples, the scholars exited the university, and the bustling townsfolk rushed home for the evening. With our former rivals gone and an agreement reached, all of these people could now look forward to peace for the foreseeable future. It was a heartwarming thought, to none more so than my emperor. Perhaps we may never arrive, he mused. Watching the glow of the sun fade into a rich muted orange as it sank towards the horizon, but with you by my side, I am sure to always travel well.